Thank you for coming to this afternoon's event. My name is Doug Irwin. I am a professor in the economics department and co-teaching Government 68, the Future of Capitalism this quarter. Um, Political Economy uh, Project sponsors a lot of uh, 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 public events. I just want to highlight the next one, which will be next Monday uh, here in this room, Rocky uh, 1 at 4.30. Adam Gopnik, uh, writer for The uh, New Yorker, is coming to talk about his most recent book on liberalism. I believe the title of the talk is uh, Liberal Minds and Liberal Morals, and uh, he'll be talking about a defense of liberalism. So uh, please join us for that if you're at all interested. Um, today we have, uh, we're very uh, pleased to have Ben Powell of Texas Tech University uh, here with us to uh, talk about um, his new book called Socialism Sucks, Two Economists Drink Their Way Through the Unfree World. Um, in Gov 68, one of the things we're trying to do is talk about different economic systems and how they work. And it's very hard if you've been born and raised in the United States to think outside of the U.S. box. What alternatives are out there? Um, he's done the unusual thing of playing economic tourist and actually going to visit some rather extreme countries, but ones that are still on the map very important today in terms of how uh, you might organize your society, organize your economy. Um, so he has different uh, uh, sections here. Uh, well, he'll tell you all about the countries that he visits, from uh, Vietnam to China to Venezuela um, and everywhere in between. Um, the theme of the book and the tour was, of course, not just economic tourism, but testing out the beards and the local brews in various places, and that's one unifying theme uh, throughout the book. Here's a copy that goes to the best student question of the afternoon, <laughs> which he will be determining, perhaps with my input, but I'll leave this right here as an incentive to think about a good question because we do want to have this as a dialogue. Um, he'll speak for about uh, 30 to 40 minutes or so, uh, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. So, Welcome to uh, Dartmouth, Ben Powell. All right. Thank you very much, Doug. It's a, a pleasure to be here and to have been visiting for the last week or so. Uh, I'm pleased to be able to talk to you about this book today. It just released this summer, and I have at least around a dozen or so universities this fall that I'm going to be talking uh, at about the book, but you guys are the first, uh, which is probably bad for you because the jokes will improve or at least get less bad by the 12th. Uh, but it also means actually you're going to help me out because based on you, I'll start adjusting this as we go. Uh, I should say something about the project overall uh, as we get started. And I think the title of the event was something more like My Travels in Socialist Countries or something like that. The book title is a little bit more provocative because I cared about selling books. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we actually kind of backed our way into it. The original subtitle was something like Two Economists' Adventures in the Unfree World or Travels in the Unfree World. And the publisher... Uh, kept sending us cover art, and it had big frothy beer mugs on it, and one even had like a German beer girl in the outfit with two, and I'm like, you guys marketing team's not quite getting this, because these covers look good to me. There's no like sucks implied in these covers. They're like, oh, okay, so broken beer glasses then, and they kind of come up with this. I'm like, yeah, okay, but there's still nothing why a book about socialism and two economist travels that indicates why you should have beer on the front of the book. Uh, so the subtitle evolved to that. And it is the book that's an actu uh, accurate reflection of Bob and I's travels. Uh, Bob's a professor at Southern Methodist and one of my best friends. And uh, he and I do tend to drink our way around when we're going places, and we wrote up the story as an honest account of our travels. In fact, the publisher's original description of it said that socialism sucks is the bastard stepchild of Milton Friedman and Anthony Bourdain. And I was like, yes, that's exactly the genre we were going for. Uh, uh, but... The beer, as, as Doug mentioned then, uh, it's not just gratuitously consumed, but actually then serves as a metaphor for how these different economies function, but reaches an audience in a, let's say, more palatable way than us usually just talking about economics, uh, so that it's a, a, a way to describe the different economies as well. Um, so the project started in 2016 for actually a couple of reasons. One, Bob wanted to go get drunk in Cuba. And <laughs> My wife didn't really want me to just go on vacation with him. And two, I wanted to figure out a way to write it off my taxes. So I'm like, I got an idea for a book. Well, we'll write up this test chapter while we're in Cuba. And we'll, because it's a genre, this is nothing like any other project I've ever done. All the other books, even when written for normal people, have been like academic presses. This is written for like normal people. Uh, well, or messed up normal people, <laughs> whichever. Uh, and we're like, I don't know if we can write in this, you know, we have to describe smells and colors and stuff like that. That's not like what economists usually do. Uh, but it ended up working out. We didn't know if we were going to end up self-publishing it or having a bestseller. So it's worked out 
better than our expectations. Uh, that was kind of the, the fun, pragmatic reason on, on the start of it. The intellectual reason is what was going on in 2016 is this, at least to me, was the first time I started becoming aware of the increasing popularity of socialism, particularly among young people. So Bernie Sanders had just come off his primary campaign that was very successful. Uh, of course, now it's much more successful this time around so far. Um, but we started seeing things like this, you know, Michael Moore tweeting out that young people are in favor of socialism, which he calls fairness, instead of capitalism, which he calls selfishness. It, this just didn't strike me right. As a college professor who not only lectures at my university, but travels around and talks at tons of other universities, Average college student I met didn't seem much like a socialist. They seemed like good people who see genuine problems in the world. And somehow, when they're giving answers to these questions now, they're saying the answer is socialism. I'm like, that's just not right. Some people aren't thinking about what socialism really is. And some free market economists maybe aren't doing a good enough job of empathizing with the problems that they're pointing out and saying, yeah, this is right, but there's alternative solutions in voluntary society and, and markets of how we could better deal with these things. Uh, so this is what motivated us to start, try to do this in a different style. Uh, and it's not just you know, Michael Moore making up stuff. The Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation survey asked uh, young people, young I think in this case was like 36 and under, uh, what's your uh, favorite economic system? 44% said socialism, 7% said communism, 42% said capitalism. Uh, you're seeing these chapters of Young Democratic Socialists of America popping up on campuses around the country. I don't know if you have one here. I forgot to look, actually. Uh, anybody know? Don't know. Okay. Uh, but people are pointing out that, you know, there's just not that stigma attached to saying you're socialist like there used to be, not among the younger people. But it's not just young people. I, I don't want to make this just like a millennial type thing. Uh, if you look, the New York Times, on the 100th anniversary of the Russian Revolution, did a column called Red Century. For 52 weeks, they ran a column in the New York Times dedicated to exploring some aspect of socialism. Out of that year, I can count one column that was dedicated to the economic stagnation in the Soviet Union, maybe a handful, a half dozen, that mention any of the mass murders or other atrocities by socialist regimes. But instead, you get columns like, why women had better sex under socialism, <laughs> which even if true, I don't know how we weight that against about 100 million dead bodies. Actually, I've got some idea how I might weight it. <laughs> but they had other ones of Lenin's eco-warriors, talking about land set off uh, for, for no development in Siberia. Meanwhile, not mentioning the horrific environmental record of the Soviet Union. There was a, 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 a whitewashing, if you will, of the Red Century throughout that column. Um, and then, of course, you've got Bernie still running, and when he, he says things like, he favor, he, I'm a democratic socialism, I favor socialism, well, what do you mean by that? Well, countries like Denmark, like Sweden, and Norway. Well, I think this confuses things for a lot of people, because there's a big problem. Those countries aren't socialist. Now, I'm also not sure how honest Bernie is, because this is the guy who went for his honeymoon in the Soviet Union and liked it. Um, or you can find AOC now saying stuff she identifies as a democratic socialist. I put insert crazy quote here as a placeholder, but then I decided it was more appropriate just to leave it like that. Uh, although, I will say though that, the, and uh, the guy who wrote the postscript to this, <laughs> wrote the postscript to this, uh, we live drank the postscript together recording it on his latest TV show, uh, Matt Kibbe, he's convinced me a lot of this, is that a lot of the young people who are attracted to Ron Paul are a lot of the same people who are attracted to AOC and Bernie Sanders. And you've got Ron Paul, who is definitely not socialist, very free market, capitalist loving guy. And then that are the opposite. But they do have something in common. They both rage against the machine. They rail against the establishment in DC, the cronyism, the insider. I see that in common. The thing is, I think people get the rage and see the injustice, but don't think through the policy prescriptions afterwards the same way. Um, so while she says crazy stuff, I think the, the anger at some things is very similar to people with very different positions on good economics. So here's the tour that we go on. So we're going to start out in Sweden, not socialism. We'll go to Venezuela, Cuba, Korea, sort of, China, Russia, Ukraine, the Republic of Georgia, and then we end back in the USSA uh, by going to the largest socialist conference in the United States, uh, which was, it was Socialism 2018, fittingly in Chicago. Uh, it was fun. I learned a lot. Uh, all right. So first, let's just get our term straight. Socialism, what it means. So this means 
We abolish private property in the major factors of production, and you replace it with some form of collective ownership. In practice, for any like country size thing, this means de facto state ownership of the means of production. And that you're then going to plan your economy because if you don't have private property in those means of production, you don't have markets for the means of production, which means it's not entrepreneurs and prices and profit and loss that are gonna coordinate economic activity. If you don't have that market process and you don't have a central plan, then you're an autarky and you're super poor. Your hippie commune ain't gonna make an iPhone comrade. So you need to coordinate across industries and workers in order to have advanced material production. And a central plan is going to do it poorly, but it's going to do it better than having no plan at all if you do not have markets to do it for you. So that's the definition. Now the thing is, in the real world, it's not all ones and zeros of communist socialism. I can think of these things as a spectrum. Pure capitalism on one far end, pure socialism on the other end. All countries in the real world falling somewhere in between on this spectrum. So there is no purely capitalist economy where there's no government ownership of any of the means of production, or, and I should say, government ownership or control. So often de facto control is what matters. You have private ownership, but government regulations or controls that are so pervasive that you take away the decision-making power, power from the nominal owners. Uh, you have no society that's a pure capitalist one where all decisions are private like that. You have some degree of regulation. And you have no society now or in history that was literally 100% government ownership or control of the means of production. The closest you probably come is the Soviet Union during the period of war communism, during the early years of Lenin's power, which was an utter disaster, and he backtracked on it going to the new economic policy, which reintroduced some markets and limited scale of private ownership and business, or maybe Mao during the Great Leap Forward from the late 1950s to the early 1960s. Um, the other Russian and Chinese systems at other times were collectivist and easy to call socialism, but not they never hit 100% pure on that. Just like we're not 100% purely capitalist in the United States. Uh, for government ownership of means of production, the K through 12 education system, that's gotta be about what, 90% government owned and controlled? Other industries in the United States, like healthcare, that are heavily regulated, still have markets and private ownership to some degree, but there's attenuations of this. It's true on both ends of the spectrum. But the main thing that we're gonna care about here is is the decision making private and coordinated through markets and voluntary transactions or through government plan? And then we can look on the spectrum. And with that, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, they're not socialist. The major factors of production are privately owned and they use markets to coordinate most of their economic activity. My co-author on this book is also the co-author of the Economic Freedom of the World Annual Report, which basically scores countries on how capitalist to how socialist you are Sweden comes in 27th freest on that index. It's mostly a capitalist economy. Denmark scores even better, so does Norway. What these countries have is a big welfare state. That's true, and it's got high taxes, but that's not socialism. I, as an economist, actually think there's a problem with it. I think high taxes in a big welfare state are bad for a country, but it's not socialism, and it's not gonna impoverish you the way socialism does. My read on the evidence of countries that adopt the big taxes and big welfare state, it slows their economic growth down. It might help you achieve some other goals, but your, your cost of that is gonna be slower economic growth. Sweden was dirt poor in the mid 19th century, became very laissez faire, grew rapidly to the mid 20th century, put in a big welfare state and high taxes, growth slowed. They're now in the bottom half of OECD countries in terms of their average incomes, but it's still a nice place. And guess what? There's lots of good beer. That's a picture outside Cafe Duval. So not very far from Belgium. I love Belgian beers. I was having delicious Belgian beer there. Problem was, it costs a lot because they tax the bejesus out of everything. <laughs> but the variety and the quality is still there. All right, Venezuela. We call this one starving socialism, unfortunately. Uh, <clears throat> So these pictures that you see here, and I'm gonna vary between some statistics and pictures throughout the talk. Uh, top left and right next to it. That's the bridge if you've seen on the news recently of the, where they blocked the bridge and won't let the aid trucks in. That's the bridge between uh, Cucuta, Colombia and Venezuela. There's actually two bridges in that town. So when we went down there, those bridges were open. It wasn't aid trucks that were flowing across it. It was two things, or it was Venezuelans, and they were doing one of two things. Either top right, applying to migrate and leave Venezuela. Or what most of them are doing in the top left, 
which is going to, uh, to Colombia to buy basic necessities, stuff that you see stacked up in the bottom right. Because Venezuela essentially cannot feed or provide much of anything else to its own population anymore. And what's weird in seeing this, Bob and I, both of us have probably been to somewhere around 50 countries. We've seen plenty of third world poverty different places. This is different than that. It's probably a little bit small in these pictures, but if you actually see the clothes and the luggage that people are using, these were middle class, upper middle class people who still had some wealth, some cash of some value that they had access to who were going there to buy basic necessities. One couple that we had one of the better conversations with, they were on a six day round trip to buy groceries. Six days, three days one way, three days the other way. They said they weren't gonna make the trip very many more times because it was becoming too dangerous of people stealing it from you on the way back. Which when we crossed into Venezuela illegally uh, on that bridge, the Venezuelan checkpoint could give two, two dams about a couple of gringos walking in. They were more interested in the people lugging suitcases because the police were stealing from the people bringing the suitcases back in. Uh, apparently their wives sent them with a grocery list to check out from the people who were legitimately buying things. Um, so what I want to say then about what's, what's gone on in Venezuela, and I apologize with the brief talk here and a tour of a bunch of countries, we're going to do a little teeny snapshot of, of each one of these places that doesn't do any one of them fully justice. But Venezuela, I want to point out, this was a rich country. You go back to 1970, its per capita income was higher than Spain. It was one of the richer countries in Latin America. It went through a long period of stagnation. So it used to also be, by the way, pretty free market. 1970 is the earliest year of those uh, economic freedom indexes. It was top 10 in the world that year in terms of economic freedom. It lost its freedom slowly over a couple decades and went into kind of an economic stagnation where it fell farther and farther behind. And where the poor weren't having the same privileges as the rich in the country. That's the vacuum where Chavez comes to power in 1998. So formerly rich country, lost its economic freedoms gradually, elects a guy who's going to do Bol uh, Bolivarian socialism. Notice I said elects free contested elections. This was democratic socialism started. Jimmy Carter was one of the international observers. Everybody said this was free and fair elections. He got reelected after that, putting in a new constitution that gave him more of the economic powers that he's going to later use. So it comes democratically to power, and things look good. For a lot of the 2000s, people say, look, Venezuela's working well. That's democratic socialism working. Except the economy was hollowing out underneath. What was going on is Venezuela sits on the world's largest oil reserves. And remember, government ownership or control of the means of production, the state oil company, was extracting those reserves while prices were high, using the revenue from that to import goodies from abroad that they handed out to the population. This made it look like things were okay, but meanwhile, they were losing the ability to produce things themselves. Eventually, right after Chavez, pretty close after when Chavez dies in 2013, and you've got people like Salon at that time writing columns saying it's Hugo Chavez's economic miracle, see democratic socialism works. Thing is, as soon as oil prices came down, now they weren't earning, actually, not only did oil prices come down, it turns out the state's not really good at running the oil company. Production's way down as well, uh, because they don't do capital improvements the same way. They're not earning enough foreign exchange. They can't import the food and other necessities to feed the people. Uh, my colleague, uh, Kevin Greer, did one of the better studies on this. Uh, it's called a synthetic control. But basically, what it means is you take a basket of other countries and weight an average of them together that mirrors Venezuela's performance. Basically, you create a fake Venezuela that never gets Chavez. Then you see what's the difference in their paths. Turns out, during that time when everyone said, oh, look, Venezuela is doing kind of good, they should have been doing a heck of a lot better based on what their previous trends were. They were uh, their incomes didn't go up as much as it should have. Infant mortality didn't go down as much as it should have. Poverty didn't get reduced as much as it should have. The only thing that they exceeded on was inequality went down by more. Except it did that without incomes going up, Basi but then without poverty improving. So basically they chopped off the top without raising up the bottom. That's what you got during the successful years of Chavez. Um, and, of course, today, now, that, um, by the way, and this oil price is coming down, so say, oh, well, it's the fault of oil price. Listen, I live an hour and a half from the Permian Basin in the United States. I was living there when oil prices came down. Still look pretty good. This, it's they had lost their ability to produce. So now, when they're not importing the same way, the average Venezuelan in 2017 lost something on the order of 24 pounds. 
They didn't all of a sudden study, discover Jenny Craig. This is not being able to feed yourself. In terms of the beer metaphor, the country ran out of beer. Now they have beer back, and it was just temporary, but they had a national beer shortage. Why? Well, they have a nominally private producer, Polar, but the government planners allocate the foreign exchange to import. Venezuela doesn't make barley. They did not allocate enough foreign exchange to the brewer to import barley. No barley, no beer, monopoly, essentially monopoly producer, national beer shortage. I don't know about you, if I were a socialist central planner, like beer, toilet paper, these are the two things that I wouldn't screw up. Uh, I mean, I would screw them up because I'm a central planner, but I'd screw them up less than everything else. Um, so what I want to point out here, a, a lesson with Venezuela. One, it's a rich country that this can happen to. But two, it's no longer democratic socialism. It's merely socialism. Last year, Maduro got reelected with something like 66%, 68% of the vote. This does not pass the smell test. Like we know when you have high unemployment or bad inflation, you throw the bums out of office. How do you get elected with two thirds or more of the vote when your country is losing weight and you have hyperinflation? You're cooking the books. So people who work for the state run firms are ordered to vote for him or lose their job. They hand out food aid at polling places. They repress opposition parties. Uh, the National Assembly this January declared an interim president as they are allowed to by the Constitution uh, who has not been able to take power because Maduro uses the military to uh, suppress it. If you don't have a large degree of economic freedom, the government then controls your livelihood and can punish dissent. Because a socialist system is necessarily going to generate stagnation in the nature of the incentives and the economics in it, that's going to have a populace that's going to vote it out of office. But once you've centralized the power and the plan, you've given the ability to repress. You lose your democratic freedoms. This is why it's not an accident that every socialist regime that we've seen in the world has become a totalitarian oppressive government. When today's socialists say, that's not my type of socialism, I want democratic socialism. The word democratic is not magic fairy dust that means socialism doesn't mean ownership or control of means of production. You still have that feature, which means you're still gonna get similar economic outcomes and the tendency on the political side to lose those freedoms as well. All right, let's get a little bit lighter and more fun. Cuba. Uh, <laughs> it's weird to say, but yeah, uh, Cuba is like the softer side of socialism. Uh, as in it's at least functioning. We call it subsistence socialism in the book. It's chugging along, doesn't seem to be going anywhere. The people aren't starving, but they're not prospering either. And Cuba, of all the places that we go, Cuba is really uh, easy to be an economist and observe just mundane economic activity because you're free to travel wherever you want. You're very safe from any sort of crime. And as long as you don't talk politics um, with uh, dissidents, you're at very little risk from the Cuban government doing anything to you. Um, so you can really observe and participate in economic activities there a little bit. So let's just do some pictures for this one with stuff. So this is, so remember, government ownership of the means of production. Hotels, part of the means of production. So you have a whole bunch of government-owned hotels all over Cuba. Now, there's a nice one, the Hotel uh, National. That's where the diplomats go. It's a five-star hotel. We could have stayed there, but that's not like really giving it, like the Soviets can send a cosmonaut into outer space. You can have one good hotel in Cuba. But we weren't going to sandbag it and try to go to shitholes either. So we asked a friend for a recommendation, and they said the Hotel Trinton. It's in the suburb of Havana, right on the ocean. Reasonable prices. I think it was like $65 a night, something like that, which sounds cheap, but that's not cheap in Cuba. Uh, that's a picture of when it opened, gleaming white. That's what it looks like today on the upper floors. The, now, notice how tall this building is. They have four elevators. You can start seeing the word on the left one where it's out of, gonna be out of service. Three of the four were out of service, which meant it was impossible to ever get the other one. So you end up hiking up eight flights of unconditioned stairs with your bags, which gets you sweaty in Cuba. Some pictures from the hotel room. Top one, panel missing in the bathroom ceiling. Um, and it turns out that actually wasn't the worst part about the bathroom because water was optional. It turns out it's not, not, not just hot water. One morning we had no water for our hotel room. Now, when you pay musicians and plumbers essentially the same wage as the Cuban government does, guess what you get? Lots of musicians, clogged toilets. <laughs> This wasn't the only one we stayed at. We also stayed at um, 
Hotel Carib, which is, uh, and we picked it kind of random. We've been on a long drive back from Trinidad. We were hot, sweaty, and pissed off. And we had a, a beer and a meal, and there was a hotel right next door. And Bob's, and this is right down the street from the, the central government building. And Bob's like, we should just get that hotel room. And I'm like, if it's as bad as the other one, I'm like, don't do it. He's like, I'll check it out. He, I think the air conditioning just tricked him. Uh, because the other one, that's the bag that came out of the, the glass that came out of the sanitary bag, the hole that was in the towel. You can see the bolt missing on the toilet, which makes it really fun because the seat just like, slides randomly off on you. And they left the soap from the previous guest. <laughs> Contrast. A little over a decade ago, I think about a decade ago, they legalized Casa Particular, people who can rent out their own, their own uh, apartments. And you can actually do this from the United States via Airbnb. Now, internet isn't very pervasive in Cuba, but Cubans all have relatives who live in Florida. And the relatives who live in Florida put pr pictures up. And by the way, your credit cards also don't work in Cuba, but they do work in Miami. And the relatives take payment, and you can arrange the same one. You can also just walk around and find them. They're plentiful. This was a two-bedroom apartment in central Havana. You can see the two bedrooms there, a little kitchenette, a living room. Everything was neat, well-maintained. The person met us there on time. Oh, yeah, the government one, I didn't even tell you. They didn't have a record of our reservation, so we had to pay twice. Uh, originally, we paid through a British website um, from abroad. Uh, this is just incentives of private property versus collective ownership. The Cuban hotels suck because no one gives a damn. The CASAs, the people have property rights to a, a limited extent, but property rights in their profits from renting it out. Thus, they reinvest some of the revenue to maintain the capital and attract customers. Difference of incentives. Same, notice, same exact service being provided, accommodation to stay. Same people doing it, same place. One big difference, the incentives of the economic system operating. Also, by the way, note, when I said it's not zeros and ones, so government ownership of the means of production is predominant in Cuba, but there's still some carve-outs of some sort of private ownership or, or private control rights over flows at least of some things. All right, <sighs> let's play a game. Uh, top left picture, students only. This is a commercial street in downtown Havana. What's missing? Signs yeah, signs and advertisement. Like, I don't know what's there. In fact, the way Bob and I do this is like we'd walk around get hot, stop, drink, do again, and just keep doing this from like 12 p.m. till midnight. The first like 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. sucked. But after that, I was just chain smoking and drinking the rest of the day, and it was more tolerable. But that strategy was actually hard there, because like you walk up to a street corner, and you look down. Is there any place I can stop and get a drink there? I don't know. How am I going to find out? I got I to walk all the way down the street and look at each storefront. Um, this is not poverty. Go to any poor country around the world. There's plenty of signs. Whoever produces beer in the country makes signs and gives them away to any other restaurant just to indicate that you can get their beer there. This is nobody giving a damn. Government ownership of the means of production. If you're not a private store that makes profits by people going there, why do you care if customers find you? Don't bother. Next picture, top right. That's a, that's a well-stocked convenience store in central Havana. What's wrong with this picture? A lot of options. That's well stocked, but there might be two dozen, if we're lucky, distinct items. So it's like that's cola at the bottom, but it's all the same. I called it Kami Cola. That wasn't the real name. <laughs> uh, but each one of those packages was that there's no variety. The socialist planners tell you you're going to get equality, but what they deliver on, if they deliver at all, is a lot of sameness, bland sameness. Contrast that. I stopped on my way up here today at a gas station in Merle, New Hampshire, and the variety was great. I mean, yet all the national beers were there, but then there's Free Flow IPA from Otter Creek Brewing in Vermont. Never heard of it. Variety was there. <laughs> the entrepreneur had an incentive to put things where I might want them, and someone else had an incentive to brew a tasty IPA that I can drink during my talk because I wrote a book with drinking in the subtitle. <laughs> um, <laughs> All right, bottom two pictures. These are private restaurants. So they, over time, have legalized some private, so they have government restaurants, government ownership means of production. They also have some private restaurants. It used to be they couldn't serve meat or seafood, and you could only seat like 12 people. 
Uh, the number has gone up of how many people you can seat, and there's no more restriction on meat and seafood. They have the right incentive, just like the CASA owners. They try hard. Uh, and at first, they seem okay. The government ones, by the way, are god-awful. The last night we went into, well, I'll explain in a moment. Uh, they're trying. In fact, some of them even have like modern you know, stainless steel kitchens that you'd expect to see in a restaurant here. But what seemed good at first, after even a few days, you start to notice it all tastes the same. All the different restaurants have about the same 12 to 18 items on the menu. And they're all bland. Cuban food in Cuba sucks. Cuba food in Miami is delicious. A Cuban sandwich that's delicious in Miami is a crappy ham and cheese in Cuba. The difference isn't the Cubans. The difference is the economic system they operate under. And in this case, both have an incentive to try, but one deals with the state supply chain for ingredients. As a result, they have no variety for their inputs, so you get the same blandness in that as well. Uh, so real quick on cars, cars in Cuba. So I intentionally picked a modern car in this picture, but you can see the quintessential classic 1950s American car in the background. They drive a bunch of 1950s cars that are held together with popsicle sticks and bubble gum. We have an embargo on, excuse me, we. Uh, Doug and I do not have an embargo on Cuba. The US government has an embargo on Cuba. But it's not a blockade. There's no US government ships preventing Kias from going in. They keep using those old US cars and other old, older but not as old cars that were imported before because the Cuban government severely rations how many imported cars they're going to let into the country. Now, I told you that the hotel room and the cast, oh, the castes were like 50 bucks a night. There was one I got for 25 bucks a night. That was great. Want to take a guess on what a 1950s US car goes for in Cuba in dollars? And keep in mind, average incomes in Cuba, income statistics are BS in a socialist country too because we don't have market prices, but somewhere in the order of two to $3,000 per capita probably. Yeah? 30, You're in the right direction. Uh, less than that for the 1950s ones, about 15,000 for something that maybe someone would pay four grand for, three grand for in the United States, which is much richer in order to restore. That guy in the front that doesn't even exist in the United States, that's more like 30,000 because it might have disc brakes or potentially even air conditioning. Uh, restrict supply enough, price goes up. All right, Korea. So we spent some time in South Korea, wonderful place. But we promised our wives we wouldn't get imprisoned or killed while writing this book. Uh, it's also the case that I direct the Free Market Institute and Bob directs the Global uh, O'Neill Global Center on Markets and Freedom. We're not going to be real popular to give a visa to from the North Korean government. So the way we decided to deal with this is we traveled in South Korea, and then you can see it a little bit from the DMZ, but because it's the DMZ, there's not as much to see there. We went up to Dandong, China on the northern border, and Dandong is the major trade city with North Korea there uh, across the Yalu River from it, and we traveled up and down the Yalu River a bit to look in and then to talk to people on the Chinese side to the extent we could. Uh, although, I still regret this, we missed out on the best opportunity on that because we had a Chinese fixer who was with us, who worked for BBC and was introduced by a mutual friend. And there was actually a strip club in Dandong, China. And I'm like, we got to go in there. And Bob's like, that's a bad idea. And I'm like, no, it's a great idea. And the fixer's like, no, no, not safe. This is not good. It, I mean, one, it would have just been huge man points as an accomplishment. But more really, the, 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 the real reason that I wanted to go in is a lot of the North, Kore North Koreans who sneak out end up working in some fashion in the sex industry on their way getting smuggled out of the country or sometimes getting trapped and not smuggled. So it would have been a better chance to interview people. You know, if you've seen the story from uh, Yanomi Park on her journey from freedom and describes the, tri the, the trials that she went through getting out, um, it would have been an opportunity to be able to talk to people more. Um, but anyhow, you can see, I mean, we were a couple, we were 100 yards off the North Korean shore, which also went read to weird things like Bob sits looking and saying, uh, Look at the Chinese Navy presence in this river. And me saying, yeah, thank God. <laughs> I didn't think I'd say that. Uh, but here's what I want to show you. Just real, see, some of you are familiar, have seen this before, in terms of the economic development of South Korea versus the North, the satellite image at night, just showing the absence of light or economic activity in the North. Well, you also see this from ground. Actually, the lighting in here isn't very good on this. Um, this top left picture. You can see the lights in Dandong. You can see on the left side kind of three arches. That's the bridge headed across the river. 
that's lit up, and then you can see darkness on the other side. Same picture in the morning, you can see those same three arches. And you can see a city of 300,000 people on the other side of the river that's virtually invisible at night. So we're starting to run a little bit shorter on time here. Oh, you don't need that. Uh, <laughs> that was supposed to be a nice contrast, like on that side. You, it's, you see sk Chinese skyscrapers, other shoulder. You see that house that was in the picture two slides ago. Like a couple hundred yards of separation, that's not a natural occurring thing. That's the difference in policies between two countries. And the difference between North Korea and China is less extreme than, of course, North Korea and South Korea. And this is where you have a great natural experiment. You know, post-World War II, North Korea, if anything, was richer than South Korea. Entire peninsula gets decimated during the, the Korean War. GDP per capita, to the extent you can believe these numbers, roughly on par by 1960 after U.S. And, and Russian aid go into the country after the Korean War. Uh, South Korea today, of course, high average incomes. It's top 20 in economic freedom. Life expectancy shoots up, mortality down, everything's wonderful. Uh, and by the way, Belgian beer can be had in South Korea cheaper than it can be had in Sweden. That's right almost next door to Belgium. Uh, North Korea today, to the extent you can believe it, under $2,000 per capita income. Uh, about 3 million people starved to death in the 1990s. Uh, no place on earth do you get one people, one language, one culture, one history, one small geography with such differences in economic outcomes like that, where the most significant difference between the two is one has collective ownership and control and the other does not. China, we call this one fake socialism. Because uh, it's a communist party that runs the country, but they've reformed the system so much that it would now be a mistake to call it socialism. So the banking sector is largely still socialized. There are still state-owned industries, but the lion's share of the economic of output of China now comes from private firms. Uh, it used to be socialist. In fact, under Mao, it was one of the most socialist regimes that ever occurred. But the reform, starting in 1978 with Deng Xiaoping, uh, I'd say up through today, but I'd say really more up through about a decade ago, have transformed it into a crony capitalist economy. I think there's problems with crony capitalism, but when you compare it to what was going on in, under socialism, it's a big improvement. Uh, and go into any major Chinese city, you're going to see major international brands, commerce and markets, private ownership. And a lot of things, and China, is, uh, in Bob's Economic Freedom Index, is the biggest improver since 1980 in Asia in terms of its economic freedom score. But that's national level policy which really understates it, because a lot of the reform in China has been at the local level, and in particular, enterprise zones in major cities that they've created that have greater economic freedoms than other parts of the country. And this one's in Shanghai. That's the you know, kind of iconic skyline that you see in Shanghai. Uh, but this is looking the same way. So this is actually old Shanghai on this side of the river, which is the side I took that picture from on the top. Across the river was the slum. That's across the river now. In early 1990s, that crossed the river became the largest free trade zone with also better financial freedoms, too, uh, in China. And it boomed. Average incomes today are close to $20,000 per person in, on the other side of the river right there. Uh, that's like, you know, South Korea is a dramatic success story that's about a generation and a half to go from pre industrial to first world status. That was 1990. It's like a blink of an eye that it's happening there in China. Um, I'm going to. I'll skip the hellish history of it. I think some people are familiar. Some people just don't know the magnitude of it. During the Great Leap Forward, ballpark, uh, Frank Dick Otter's new book, He Had Better Access to the Archives, is probably the best estimate that's out there now. It puts it at about 45 million unnecessary deaths during that time period. Um, and this is when they really collectivized agriculture, collectivized land, forced labor. The reform process, I've already talked a bit about, but the one part I want to say, migration. A lot of people, I gave a talk on migration last week here. The income differences between rural China and cities in China are often as big as the income differences between Latin American countries and the United States. Uh, you lose some of your state welfare benefits when you move in China, but you're essentially free to move from the rural area to the cities, and hundreds of millions of them have. And a lot of that big economic growth we've seen in China has been migration driven. If we had greater freedom to migrate uh, between countries, we'd see some more of that growth like that here in the United States too, possibly. Uh, still a scary police state. Uh, while I was there, I was invited to speak at the Unirule Institute. 
Uh, Unit Rule Institute has been an independent free market institute in Beijing since the early 1990s that's advocated for greater economic freedoms and reforms. Um, when I spoke there uh, with Bob and a couple other people, they were having a conference on Ayn Rand and Austrian economics. And I was like, this is cool. I'm like, I'm in Beijing and I'm going to talk about this with a bunch of Chinese academics. Uh, that was, uh, I think, a Friday night. Saturday morning, the conference was supposed to continue. We weren't part of it anymore. Uh, but I got an email from the friend who had introduced us to them saying, I hope you didn't go to the conference today. The Chinese government shut it down. They chained the doors to the building shut, had thugs there to beat up people trying to go in. And the founder of the institute, who was in his 80s, was put under house arrest for the day. Um, Unirule has, that was 2017. Unirule just shut its doors last month because the government ceased giving it authority to exist. I'm skipping Russia, so let's just talk about a success story before we wrap up then. So former, Republic of, former Soviet Republic of Georgia. Here's a country where you get essentially no economic reform for over a decade after the fall of the Soviet Union. And this actually, we talked about before, I'm not sure that this is much as a crisis, but this is just a leadership change that had different ideas. Uh, uh, Saakashvili becomes president. He's educated in, uh, I think, a lawyer from Columbia University. From Columbia University. Uh, and uh, he basically kind of has some Washington consensus type ideas about reform and growth. Um, but he appoints this guy, uh, Kaha Bendukits, uh, who is a very wealthy uh, person at the time in, in Ukraine, but who's basically a, a libertarian capitalist to be his finance minister, and says, go ahead and reform the economy. Uh, so this isn't start, Rose Revolution's 2004. He gets into, into power and starts making these economic reforms. And they put in a 12% flat income tax, eliminate bunches of other taxes and reduce rates. The big thing, so most economic indicators in Georgia started proving pretty quick. The one that doesn't is unemployment. Unemployment goes up to something like 36% because he enti fired entire bureaus at once. Uh, he just went through, it would be like walking into the Department of Agriculture today and be like, all right, all of you are fired. <laughs> uh, actually, what he did, was, this was really kind of cute. He'd go to some of the bureaus, and he'd call for everybody to come into a central room like this, and he'd ask his assistant to count how many people were in the room. And the assistant would count, and then he'd say, how many does it say work here? And so, you know, you know there's 100 people in the room. Oh, it says 600 people. Okay, now only 100 people work here. Everybody else is fired. <laughs> uh, and, would, and would do that repeatedly. Uh, in fact, my favorite one is he fired the entire country's traffic police in one day. All of the traffic police gone. And the joke is in Georgia that crime went down <laughs> because, <laughs> because they were super corrupt and they just pulled you over to extract, extract bribes. In fact, today, this is a police station in Georgia. When they build new police stations, they make them of glass to signal transparency. Uh, they came down really hard on this regime on, uh, on corruption, which is... I want to say mostly a good thing in the context of these reforms as they had to break the, the cycle, uh, but ultimately they were very harsh on people in their punishments for very mild acts of corruption, and that grew resentment that eventually got uh, the president out of office probably. Um, unions are legal, but they have no special privileges that any people don't have on their own. Uh, they put in something called the Economic Freedom Amendment, uh, which keeps deficits below 3% of GDP, debt below 60% of GDP, and if you want to pass a new tax, you have to ask for a popular referendum. The government can't put it in place itself. So basically, he handcuffed the next government when he was leaving office. And they renewed it when we were in Georgia. They were debating the renewal. Uh, and we got to debate some local um, professors on that. Uh, but they ultimately renewed it. Uh, they cracked the top 10 in economic freedom in the world, something that was unranked before 2004 because you couldn't even get data out of them. Dramatic transformation. Countries booming. Uh, incomes are up. It's still very poor, about $8,000 per capita. Uh, but actually using that same synthetic control uh, approach, uh, Greer and Lawson did a paper together on uh, Rose Revolution, and it's about 40% higher than what would be expected otherwise uh, in terms of the incomes. And in terms of the booze, also great success. Uh, so the Soviet central planners were commies, not idiots, so they figured out that warm Georgia could make wine better than, say, Siberia. So Georgia made wine for the Soviet Union, but they did it on fertile farmland, and they used like international grapes that you'd be familiar with, you know, Merlots, Cabernets, and such. That's all gone, because they mass-produced swill. So once they got economic freedom, they tore that stuff up, went back to indigenous Georgian grapes, names of which you've never heard of and I can't pronounce, 
and old school winemaking practices. Where was that previous picture? Uh, down there in the bottom, this is actually in somebody's house. And this goes down to clay vats that are below ground. And they crush the grapes, leaving the stems and the skins on, even on whites, and let it ferment there and then extract. So their whites are like a golden color. It's very different than any white wine that you've had in the United States, probably. Um, and it's delicious. Uh, and it's booming. Uh, exports to the United States were up 50% year over year last year uh, from the Georgian wine industry. So again, mirroring what's going on in the economy. So to wrap up then, we end up back in the USSA, attend the socialist conference, and uh, didn't really argue with people uh, at all. I just asked them all, what brought you here? What does socialism mean to you? What are you interested in? And the summary of what I learned from them is basically over ha half, maybe more than half, aren't really socialists. Point blank ask them, do you want to abolish private property and replace it with some sort of state or collective ownership? Nope. So what concerns you? And then it's usually an issue. Pick it, whether it's environment, immigration, gender issues, income inequality, pick some issue. They see an injustice. And actually, most of these things, when they say them, I'm like, yeah, I agree with you. That's not right. And then they say, so socialism's going to fix that. I'm like, socialism means like big government control of the economy. I don't think that's a good way to, even if that would fix your problem, the host of other problems you're going to get with that are going to be awful. And in often this case, I don't actually don't think it's going to fix your problem. It might make it, make it worse. Then there's a minority of them, but still significant, who really do mean collectivize the means of production, but they want it to be socialism from below, or democratic socialism, and explicitly say, no real world socialist system is what what I talk about because I want democratic socialism. And they miss this connection between collectivizing the means of production and losing your political freedoms in the bargain. Um, but mostly good, well-intentioned people who I think we need to do a better, or people like me need to do a better job talking to them and recognizing the problems that they, they, they see and saying, well, there's better ways that we could do this to reform our own system that don't equate to jumping on to something called socialism without really understanding it. I'll also say that the, the hotel, and this is the beer taps on the other picture there, you see a green one with a big fist and a red star on it. It's Revolution IPA. Uh, Revolution is a brewing company. It's the largest independent uh, beer bottler in Illinois. And uh, all of their beers have commie logos of some sort and memorabilia. Uh, but the irony is that this privately owned company that was making beer that was being sold at the Socialist Conference makes a greater variety and quality of beer than all of the socialist countries in the world combined. <laughs> it's differences in the incentives. Uh, so I'll wrap up with, the book has done really well. We made it all the way up to number five on Amazon, like overall. So by far the best nonfiction selling on Amazon that day. But in my own personal thing that I found was cool, we've for almost continuously since we released this summer, it's been the number one book in the category of socialism simultaneously with the number one category of beer. <laughs> it wasn't a life goal, but it is an accomplishment. <laughs> uh, so with that, I'll, I'll end there and take um, whatever questions you might have. With the, by the way, uh, uh, Professor Irwin said the best question gets this book for free, but the rest of you fear not. I have books with me that I'll happily sell you for $20 <laughs> if you ask qu crappier questions. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, the floor is open. Uh, only students are eligible for the free book, so ah. you have to judge the best question by Luckily, I don't discriminate against older people who have $20 bills. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Um, I have a question with your approach to deciding which beers to drink, as weird of a question as that sounds. Oh, it's great. Because um, you mentioned that you were drinking Belgian beer in different places, and I was wondering if you were trying to, like I know a lot of countries have like a national beer like brand, and I was wondering if you were analyzing both the ability to get foreign beers um, in like these various countries and like the quality of the national beer, because that would be kind of two different measurements of just like how well the economy is functioning and the ability to kind of have variety. Yeah, that's a great question. And so yes, we did both. And maybe I could have emphasized some more of it in the talk. For example, so Cuba, you've got two types of beer, Bacanero and Cristal. And one of them's like 4.5% alcohol, one's 5% alcohol. They both taste like a Budweiser that you left out in the sun too long. It, you have very low penetration of any foreign beers available there. 
Uh, contrast that with China, the Tsingtao beer. I don't think it's very good. I mean, I can drink it. Um, but you go into any major city, and you've got places that have a wide variety. We found a Belgian beer bar in Dandong. Like, it wouldn't surprise me to find them in Shanghai and Beijing, but Dandong? Like, awesome. OK, cool. So uh, yeah, it's not just what they produce themselves. Because I mean, listen, I, I'm originally from Massachusetts. I don't want to drink any Massachusetts wine. But I have no problem having a great uh, variety of good quality wine when I'm in Massachusetts because they import it from everybody everywhere else. Uh, but you don't see that the same in the other countries. And by the way, the Korean beer, the North Korean beer is god awful. Uh, it's, uh, Bob and I drank one of them on camera with someone doing an interview, and we couldn't get through it. I'm not the type of person who doesn't finish a beer. Uh, like what, I've had to change my words because when I go into a bar, if I see taps and I see something I haven't had, I'll be like, oh, I'll try that. And they bring me over like a little shot glass. I'm like, no, 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 I meant it like a man. I, when I say try it, give me a glass, I will drink it all. Uh, if I don't like it, I'll switch after the North Korean. I couldn't make it through. What Bob said is, uh, he said if he lived there, he guess he'd drink it, but he'd hope it killed him before the state does. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah? Um, so you mentioned inequality at the, uh, towards the end of your talk. And um, I was just wondering, A, if you, if you think it's an issue, and if so, um, if democratic socialism isn't the answer, what do you think is? I think, so in my, so I think it's a inequality is a symptom of something that's a problem. To me, inequality per se is not the problem. It's how it's generated. So I want to think about barriers to mobility, barriers to success, barriers to realizing your dreams, ambitions, however you want to pursue them. And it might be that you pursue goals that make your incomes wildly unequal with other people. But if you're free to s pursue your passions and ambitions, and you, just, uh, you get the outcome you want and desire, but it's income inequality, I'm fine with that. But when I think about things that prevent people from doing that and generate the inequality, that's where I think. So things like occupational licensure in the United States. So we have to, it's becoming widespread. I mean, Arizona re licenses rain dancers. Uh, how are they ensuring quality with this? Uh, the, uh, don't know. It's pervasive across states now, a number of occupations being like, and then the other states don't recognize it. But that means when one part of the country is being successful and another country is stagnating, it's harder for people to move. There was a study, I think it said, if you worked in a licensed occupation, you were something like 30% less, less likely to move between US states. That's a big barrier to people adapting to an economic system in order to keep generating income that makes things unequal in the end. It, that's not by far not the only one, but I'd think about other things that are, are like that, the way w that we regulate housing and make housing completely unaffordable so that your unequal incomes then matter a lot for people trying to live on either coast of the country. Uh, I live in Lubbock, Texas. It's going to remain affordable because they let you build new homes. Well, and because the land's flat and you can just keep building on it. Uh, but they don't limit the permissions. California severely limits their permissions. What's scarce in California isn't buildable land, it's permission. Uh, and I think that makes the inequality of incomes there worse because your cost of living is jacked up so much by this. So I would think about things like that because I think the young socialists who say incomes are getting more unequal and it doesn't matter, I'm like, yeah, I think it does. But let's talk about like real ways to get at helping people. Yeah? What's the best example um, that you encounter in travels of entrepreneurial spirit in a clever way on your adventure? Just to run a hustler or you know, making a clever cross market? I think there's always so many great examples from social countries of people's entrepreneurial hair sellers. Venezuelans who lacked the money to buy the necessities in Cucuta, Colombia. There were entrepreneurs in Cucuta who were on, in fact, I talked with one, it was an interesting conversation, uh, uh, on the bridge. And they were yelling out for people to sell their hair. And they, yes, and they use them to make hair extensions. Uh, but you could, if you're a Venezuelan who just had hair but no money, you could go and sell your hair. And uh, I, the way I, I read about it before, so when I heard him doing it, I went up to him, and my Spanish is very bad. I grew up playing basketball with Puerto Ricans and like, took one class in high school. Uh, <laughs> but, so, but I still try. Uh, it, uh, but I had a guy from the Pan Am Post who was with us then, too. And so then he started to try to translate, because when I asked, uh, she just like, kind of laughed at me and said she didn't want my hair. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, come on, red hair is scarce where we are right now, but apparently it's also not in demand. <laughs> uh, but what I was trying to get from her was the price. And 
it varies. And it was like long, high quality hair. Could get you as much as like 70 bucks. But normal was more like 20, 25 bucks, I think, if I remember correctly. Um, which doesn't sound like much, but in terms of what you could buy for supplies, that was a non insignificant. That might be minimum wage earnings for a week or something like that. Um, I'm, I'm spitballing that actual number, but um, yeah, that might be the most interesting. Yeah? Um, so you started to talk by stating that the younger generation is more likely to favor essentialism over capitalism. And I guess I'm just wondering if you have discovered any or pinpointed any mechanisms that have allowed or pr prompted socialism to be so glorified among the younger generation. And if you think that people can use the change if they have the opportunity to travel to these countries. OK, so definitely yes on the second part of this. Uh, and hopefully, if they just read the book, that'll be a poor substitute. Uh, on the first part, I think, and it, it, it's just the evidence. I'm only seeing a little bit of it, and it's not in the book at all. But that actually, there's a difference between millennials and Gen Z, where it becomes less popular with Gen Z. Um, I wonder how much of this goes with a significant number of millennials coming of age or coming to economic activity at the time of the Great Recession, and equating that with capitalism rather than that being a, a bad version of crony capitalism, a lot of what went, went on there. I think there's something to that. I mean, that's not science. This is uh, casual empiricism that I'm suspicious of there. Then I think with everybody, just if you grew up post-Cold War era, I think there's um, something to that as well. You wanted to? So, yeah, there is research that you're kind of clearly imprinted by what you grew up doing. It's the Reagan era, something that happened. So it's consistent. Right. It's also consistent with who was at that socialism conference. If you grew up during the Reagan years, or if you came of age in the 80s or 90s, you were not at the socialism conference. It was people under 35 and ex-1960s hippies who are now in their 70s. Um, not entirely, but basically. Yeah? So a lot of people that are very critical of capitalism, kind of, like to me, the most compelling argument is that income inequality is really, like such drastic income inequality is unhealthy. Um, but when you look at the countries that you went to where the government really loves a lot of it, the corruption is rampant and there's no real check on the government, whereas in capitalism, there, the government can be a check on the rich and powerful. So why do you think there's a disconnect there between people that are very anti-capitalism um, and they're saying the government should have more power, but they're not understanding that when the government is the end-all, be-all, then corruption is right there? How do you, how do you explain that? Uh, what's the best way to extend that? To rhetoric that? versus reality, right? Socialism preaches goals of equality, but you end up with two-tier systems where the, the government and the ruling elite live well and the normal person does not. Um, but it starts with what sounds like noble goals. Um, and I think it's the appeal of the sound of it without thinking through what's the political economy of how it's actually going to operate and function. Um, yeah? Well, uh, I wanted to find out if, if like the Georgia situation right, yes. is such a miracle. I don't think there's a universal answer to that. Uh, Professor Err and I were talking a little bit at lunch today about, because part of the answer is it's often not in the interest of those people who have power to let such reforms happen. So they live well and are going to dis be, be, be displaced and not be better off if reforms happen. So what we were talking about is things like crisis that break political equilibria. Then often it's a bit of an accident of history of who's there with the right ideas. Sometimes it's standard interest group politics stuff. But other times, the right people at the right time, which is really what I'd call the Georgia one. I, uh, Bob is the real expert on Georgia. He's been there something like 17 times now. Uh, and I grilled him on this a bit because the Virginia political economy kept coming through. Well, what was the interest group formation? How did it align in order to let, and he's really like, there was no ideological shift in Georgians. There was no real, in, he's like, the guy walked around with roses to show that he was peaceful and he was not gonna be corrupt. He got elected and he got the right finance minister. That was basically his answer to Georgia. Um, I wouldn't be looking uh, for North Korea making a transformation like that anytime soon. Nicole has been here for much longer. Yeah. That's all I, know. <laughs> uh, I 
so, so we're doing the Soviet style, we get in line. <laughs> <laughs> we could use a market, I'll take a buck from whoever wants to go first. <laughs> Um, this might be a bit out of the scope of your book, uh, but looking at the, your experience in Cuba, how do you think socialism relates to like, the digital world? Obviously, Cubans have kind of built a bit of a private sector with like Airbnb, not only in Casa Particulares, but with like services. Um, so how do you think that plays in? How do you relate to like, individuals start emerging, like, uh, emerging from the private sector? Or the digital space? Well, I think the bigger tensions in China, right? because you have political repression there, but in an economy where they care about still having booming economic growth. And so there's like a, a tension between these two things. If you limit access to information and internet, you're gonna not do as well on the growth thing that you might care about, but you need that for your political suppression. That you, that's where the bigger tension. Cuba, I don't really know, know if they give a damn about economic growth. I mean, the place is still using 56K dial-ups um, and not very often. All right. Um, was there anything that you came across in your travels that challenged your expectations of what you were expecting from either socialism or capitalism? Um, not so much from the system, but maybe the particular manifestations of it. I think what was striking with Venezuela was seeing that it wasn't poor Venezuelans that were making it to the border, that this is what happens to upper middle income people, middle income people. Um, that was fairly striking. The, um, the question we got in Georgia a lot that was very good, and it's not surprising to me as an economist, but it's a good question of how a normal person perceives this, is that here talks by Bob and I about, because we lectured at universities when we were there too, uh, about economic freedom and how, it, how Georgia's doing great and how it just causes prosperity. Then they'd say, but we're still poor. Would be like, yeah, because growth compounds over time. So it, you can't go from being poor to being rich like that. And unless you migrate across borders, then you can do that. But in your own country, it's got to compound. I mean, that wasn't surprising to us. It's a, it's a great place to go tour uh, because it is booming, but it is still like Eastern Europe was maybe circa, you know, at least Czech Republic circa 2000 or something like that. Going to Czech Republic now, you might as well go to Western Europe. It's not that much different. Going to Georgia is still different. It's still very much in transition. And it's very safe. Um, that said, I hope we get to a world where there is no like tourism of, oh, you can see a place that's different because it hasn't grown yet. I'd like them all to succeed and grow. Yeah? yeah you mentioned welfare. Um, how do you feel about the Andrew Yang or, or UBI in general? Uh, that UBI is a horrible idea. Uh, but <sighs> specific, so. I don't think it's actually good for someone's uh, character, honestly. But when it comes to like specific proposals in the United States, any UBI that would be big enough to deal with poverty cannot be a UBI. The arithmetic doesn't work. So how, how, how about like the, uh, the proposal from the United Amendment, the, the crowdsourced constitutional amendment, the United Amendment? It's, it's more focused on poverty, uh, people who need it. Well, as soon as we're focusing on people in need, which I agree is what we should be doing instead of everybody, then we're not doing universal basic income. Because like the whole attraction of universal basic income, everybody gets that income no matter what, so you don't get any of the, uh, the bad incentives where if I do more, I earn less type thing. And you're not looked down upon for being on the dole because everybody gets the same thing. Just to do it to everybody makes it really, really expensive, which means the number that you can actually give everybody is enough so that the person who's only getting UBI isn't getting out of poverty. So I think I'd like to, th instead of, I think UBI is just something that people talk about. It's no, there's no probability of it happening in the United States. Um, I'd rather think about, I guess, back to your question about the, how do we get barriers out of the way for people getting out of poverty. Just about out of time, so we have time for one last question. Okay. Yes, sir. How do you think socialism and automation play a role with each other? And what do you think of governments, um, I guess, do you think governments should restrict automation in order to keep working? No. Uh, uh, whether it's automation, whether it's technological change, whether it's trade changes in trade flows, our, our economy is innovating and advancing. And to do that, you always have to be able to destroy jobs. What we want to do is make the labor market as flexible as possible to let people get reemployed and, and back to work. Uh, that locking anything in place is a recipe for stagnation um, that would be bad for us. And I do think, though, that when you talk to, 
So young people overwhelmingly in post-socialist countries are ha happier making a transition to capitalism. You can find old people who say, I, I wish I, I liked the old system better. And the older you are when you're displaced, the harder it is to re-employ as productively. This is true for older workers in the Midwest and the United States when we trade with China more who get unemployed. It's also true for older people in the Soviet Union who worked under that old system then getting re-employed in a market economy. Um, and I don't, I, I think those two things are related. So with that, uh, I've got a candidate for the winner. Okay, it's got to look right there, so. Uh, yours was the question about the hair, right? Yours, right there, okay, I knew it was right there. Are you okay with that? Absolutely. Otherwise, the beer question right out the gate. I, al I, almost, th I almost threw you the book then. <laughs> all right, well, thank you all very much. Thank you.